Good day. My name is Jean-Michel Molina from the University of Paris, and it's my pleasure to be part of this conference today and to address the issue of HIV prevention in high-risk population. Let's start by these slides to outline the different prevention strategies we could have today uh, against HIV without a vaccine on the horizon, and you may have heard of the recent failure of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for HIV prevention in Africa. We have three um, behavioral strategies, abstain, be faithful, and condoms. And we should clearly continue to uh, reinforce the use of condoms by people who have uh, um, a trace sexual behavior. We know that we could also uh, use circumcision in males to reduce the uh, incidence of HIV infection and the risk of transmission from women to men. For people who are using uh, drugs intravenously, we uh, should rely on harm reduction programs with opioid substitution and sterile syringes. And uh, clearly we have also drugs we could rely on for HIV prevention. And drugs have proven to be very effective to uh, reduce the transmission of mother to child during pregnancy, for post-exposure prophylaxis, for the treatment of HIV infection, and this is the basis of the test and treat strategy since people with HIV infection, when they are fully suppressed on treatment, do not uh, transmit infection to their uninfected partners. And more recently, PrEP has been uh, also one of the main strategies that is supposed to uh, um, be able to lead in combination with the test and treat strategy to the elimination of HIV in the future, we hope. So what is PrEP? PrEP is the use of drugs for HIV negative individuals uh, who have uh, sexual exposure to HIV, uh, usually because they don't use condoms. And these drugs have to be used before and after uh, sexual exposure. So uh, uh, people should you know, continue to be on drugs or use drugs on demand. We'll uh, come back to that. Um, on, on this slide, I have tried to uh, highlight a couple of issues uh, regarding what could be and what should be the ideal PrEP regimen. Uh, clearly, we want to have a regimen for PrEP, uh, which is 100% effective, as good as a condom, uh, when taken as recommended. And we know that uh, this is uh, clearly an issue with PrEP regimen to make sure that people follow uh, the recommendations. These PrEP regimens should also work for all population, not only for MSM, but for heterosexual men and women, for IV drug users, in adolescence, and during pregnancy. Adherence, which is the Achilles heel of uh, prevention, should be simple for, uh, for uh, participants. They should, uh, these PrEP regimens have a high forgiveness, and that's why there is such a high interest in long-acting formulation that may overcome these issues with uh, adherence to PLs. And we should also give uh, um, people a clear guidance on how to stop and start PrEP. The uh, assessment of adherence um, uh, should be also uh, available, and we should not only rely on self-report by participants, because we know this is not uh, the best way to measure adherence. What about breakthrough HIV infection uh, using PrEP? This may occur. If they occur, they, their diagnosis should be simple and rapid, and we should try to avoid drugs uh, which may lead to um, uh, drug resistance, and especially if there is cross-resistance to the drugs we use for the treatment of HIV infection. The safety of the PrEP regimen should be uh, ideally perfect uh, in healthy individuals. And regarding implementation, which is one of the challenges we're facing today with PrEP, uh, clearly uh, the regimen should be easy to use. They should be self-administered, ideally at an affordable cost. Cost is clearly one of the big issues with PrEP today. And in the future, we may want to combine uh, prevention of HIV with contraception and prevention of STIs. So if we look at the um, you know, global map of PrEP implementation, and this is from the uh, AVAC website, you can see uh, that uh, by the first trimester of uh, uh, 2021, only a million of people uh, worldwide have initiated PrEP, and this is short from the three millions uh, that was uh, supposed to be uh, using uh, PrEP uh, in 2020, according to uh, the UN commitment in, in 2016. And as you can see, there is a wide disparity across countries 
in the use of PrEP, with more people using PrEP in the US, in, in Africa, in particular South Africa or East Africa, some part of Europe, Australia, and Brazil. What are the uh, different regimens that are available today? We are lucky enough to have now more and more regimens, uh, and so people have a choice, and that's great to have options and choice uh, when it's uh, come to uh, yeah, choosing PrEP regimen. So I will review this uh, uh, regimen briefly, um, highlighting um, you know, in bold those who are already approved or uh, very shortly be approved. So let's start with the Dapivirine vaginal rings, uh, approved by EMA uh, last year and recently recommended by WHO as a new choice for HIV prevention in women. And this is based on the results of two large phase three studies in Africa, uh, in young women, where um, these women use a um, vaginal ring, which they self-insert every four weeks, containing 25 milligrams of dapivirine. And in a placebo-controlled study, the effectiveness in reducing HIV incidence was between 27 and 30%. And this effectiveness was even higher in open label trials from 39 to 62%. There are a number of uh, ongoing studies with vaginal rings in adolescents uh, uh, and uh, pregnant women, in breastfeeding women. Um, uh, extended duration depivian rings of three months are uh, also being uh, tested. And also uh, the combination of depivian with uh, contraceptive. So uh, there is a, uh, clearly a, a number of uh, opportunities to use uh, these vaginal rings. There are limitations though, uh, because of the you know, somewhat low effectiveness, um, probably because this is only a topical prep and this is very, there's very limited uh, um, dissemination of drugs in, in plasma. Uh, there is also an issue with uh, the use of NNTIs according to the high prevalence of NNTIs in, in uh, countries like uh, uh, Africa, uh, which might even reduce the effectiveness of prep. And also we don't know enough of the about the long-term acceptability of uh, vaginal rings by women and their partners. What about PLs? What's new in PLs is FTAF. FTAF is a combination of two drugs like TDF-FTC, which is the well-known uh, PrEP regimen. So FTAF, uh, daily FTAF was compared in a placebo-controlled study among MSM uh, in an international uh, study. And as you can see here, looking at the incidence after two years in green with FTAF 0.16 per 100 person years versus 0.30 with um, FTDF. Uh, and clearly when you look at the incidence rate ratio, um, the uh, results favor uh, FTAF, but uh, the uh, benefit was not such as to show a superiority of FTAF as compared to FTDF. And so clearly the study shows that FTAF was not inferior, but not superior to FTDF in that study. And so what's, what's the point of using uh, FTAF? Um, you know, uh, the hypothesis was that FTAF would be associated with a better safety profile, in particular, uh, better renal safety profile. But when you look at the median change from baseline in EGFR uh, or after two years, you can see in blue that with FTAF, the median increase was actually only 3.7 ml per minute, which was actually very small. Uh, and even though this difference was statistically significant in favor of, uh, uh, of FTAF, um, this is not uh, clinically relevant. Uh, if you look at uh, renal discontinuations uh, during the study, only two individuals receiving FTAF and six uh, FTDF discontinued because of renal events and eventually only a single individual uh, receiving FTDF uh, developed with Fanconi syndrome after more than a year of uh, TDF use. And, and that's probably uh, one of the reasons why FDA approved uh, FTAF only uh, for MSM right now, because we don't have yet data among uh, women. Uh, studies are ongoing. Uh, there are no uh, data using event-driven uh, uh, TAF-FTC yet. Uh, and um, because of these uh, issues regarding safety with uh, no uh, clinical uh, evidence of uh, a better safety profile, uh, the ISUSA guidelines recommended the use of TAF-FTC only when the EGFR was uh, below 60 per ml or in case of a prior history of osteopenia and osteoporosis, 
And this is uh, all because of the cost, uh, since we have generic TDF FTCs in many places in the world and not generic TAF FTC uh, today. But if you look at what happened in the US where uh, the issue of cost is not that relevant, um, not as much in many other places in the world, you can see that the uh, increase used from uh, 2019 to 2020 uh, was from 2,000 individuals to uh, more than uh, 76,000 individuals using TAF FTC. So, uh, you know, at the same price, uh, and if we, when we have generic TAF FTC, it, it is very likely that people will switch to, uh, to TAF FTC. What about the 211, the uh, event driven or on demand prep regimen with the uh, TDF FTC? Well, we, we presented at Croy this year. Uh, the three year results of the Prevenir IRS study, uh, a large core study among MSM using uh, either daily or on demand prep. And people actually in that study choose to uh, use either regimen, they could even switch. And after a median follow up of 22 months per uh, individual, the global incidence, as you can see, was very low 0.11 per 100 person years, uh, with only six breakthrough HIV infection. And when you look at the incidence per a dosing regimen, you can see that it was exactly similar. Uh, and so both regimen are clearly uh, highly effective to prevent HIV uh, prevention among MSM. Still, there are limitations with even driven PrEP. Uh, we showed that there were more frequent uh, drug-related gastrointestinal adverse events with on-demand PrEP. We don't have data in heterosexual men and women, and this regimen is therefore restricted to MSM. No data yet with TAF FTC and studies are planned. And we want to go beyond the 211 and try to uh, develop even more simple regimen uh, uh, on demand for the future. But the breakthrough of the year in terms of PrEP was clearly the data released on two large cabotegravir trials for prevention, the HPTN084 trial among young uh, women in Africa led by uh, Shinet Delaney, which showed uh, that in a double-blind placebo-control study uh, in women who received either cabotegravir or uh, injection every two months or TDF-FTC as a daily pill, you could see that in blue, uh, the incidence with cabotegravir was only 0.2 and it was 1.86 with TDF-FTC, a pretty high incidence with PLs. And clearly, when you look at the hazard ratio, there is uh, clearly... Uh, a significant benefit of uh, using cabotegravir with a nearly 90% reduction in HIV incidence as compared to TDF-FTC. Why is that? One of the main explanations is actually the issue of adherence. In that study, women came every two months to receive their cabotegravir injection, and as expected, the coverage of cabotegravir injections in the right-hand side was nearly 90%. On the left-hand side, uh, however, uh, when you look at uh, women who uh, were... Uh, taking uh, a peel within the last 24 hours, uh, looking at the red bars with concentration of TDF uh, at least 40 nanogram per ml, you can see that this proportion of women dropped to only 34% were really on a daily uh, regimen. Similar results showing um, a superior uh, efficacy of cabotegravir versus TDF FTC in a double blind placebo controlled study. Um, was also uh, shown by uh, Rafi Landowitz, and these results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, this time in an MSM and transgender women population with, uh, again, incidence uh, quite low with cabotegravir 0.4 and quite high with Tenofovir FTC 1.2. And this is actually tenfold higher um, than the incidence we reported among uh, the same MSM population in the Paris region. So issues of adherence in a double-blind study when people are receiving injections may have also uh, led to uh, such a high incidence with TDF-FTC uh, because of low adherence. Uh, one of the issues in that study were uh, a couple of breakthrough infections in the uh, red rectangle here in people received injections of cabotegravir. And in addition, um, uh, uh, four out of five tested patients develop uh, cabotegravir resistance, which can be uh, also uh, resistant uh, in some ways to dolotegravir. So this is an issue that should be closely uh, you know, monitored. And indeed, there are potential limitations of cabotegravir long-acting because of the burden of two monthly injections, although people so far 
are quite happy with these injections. Uh, they need a nurse. Uh, it cannot be self-administered. Uh, there is also a leading phase of oral pills that may be not needed in the future. Uh, there is a unknown time to protection and forgiveness. Uh, there are a couple of people complaining of uh, injection site reaction, but I guess the two main limitations are the emergence of integrase resistance and potential cross-resistance to DTG in those with breakthrough uh, HIV infection, although the breakthrough, again, are rare. And, and also, uh, we, we need to better understand why these breakthrough can occur since people receive their injections. And, and uh, clearly, there is also an issue with the diagnosis that can be delayed. That's why we need to develop alternatives and other PrEP regimen. One of the uh, key uh, candidates is Islatrovir, a new uh, brevis transcriptase uh, inhibitor, which is also a translocation inhibitor that is being developed for both treatment and prevention. And in this uh, uh, PK study reported by 4P, you could see that uh, when given uh, a single pill once monthly, uh, the uh, participants could achieve, when you look at Islatrovir triphosphate concentration, uh, in PBMCs, uh, even at the, uh, uh, after four weeks, a concentration that remain above the threshold that was defined as a threshold probably associated with uh, effectiveness as shown in the macaque model and uh, in patients uh, regarding the antiviral activity. Uh, and the studies are actually have started with this uh, one monthly peel for PrEP, and this is uh, obviously interesting to uh, see whether a single peel uh, taken one monthly is able to prevent HIV acquisition. Islatravir could also be used uh, and, uh, as an implant, and uh, Merck, who is uh, developing uh, this uh, drug for prevention, has shown interesting PK data. And you can see that when the implant is uh, inserted, you can reach very high Islatravir triphosphate concentration above the threshold uh, for at least 12 weeks in the left-hand side panel. And even when you remove the implant, you continue to have a high enough concentration for the following three weeks. And in a model, it was uh, shown that um, you know, projected concentration of Islatravir triphosphate above the threshold associated with efficacy could be maintained for up to a year. So uh, again, studies with this implant of Islatravir uh, will start uh, in a couple of weeks now. And this is also very exciting to uh, test Islatravir implant uh, for, for PrEP that could be used both for men and women, actually. Another uh, important candidate for uh, the use of PrEP in the future is lenacapavir. Lenacapavir is a new antiviral. This is a first-in-class capsid inhibitor, uh, which has recently shown an activity in uh, patients with multi-drug resistant viruses. And this drug also uh, has shown uh, a potential for prevention. And in this uh, study reported at CROI in macaques, with a single injection in macaques, you uh, were able to uh, protect the macaques from rectal challenges uh, over the 15 weeks. And uh, what's interesting with this drug is that it can be given subcutaneously in the abdomen every six months. So that's also uh, an interesting uh, a drug for uh, PrEP, and studies have already started to assess its uh, potential in uh, phase three trials. So in summary, uh, we don't have yet the ideal PrEP agent, uh, but long-acting PrEP uh, uh, drugs could be game changers for uh, prevention of HIV. We have now a lot of data with cabotegravir. Uh, we will have uh, in the next couple of uh, months or years, new data with the Slatravir, both the monthly peel and the yearly implant. And with Lenacapavir, we have a, a subcutaneous injection every six months. And in the future, we may dream of a prevention method which uh, would be able to combine prevention for HIV, contraception, and prevention for STIs. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. <laughs>